There's a press release by the Cleveland Clinic that makes an argument for the popular sugar substitute erythritol causing dangerous clotting in our blood. Obviously, clumping of cells in our blood can lead to disastrous consequences since clumps of material are responsible for blockages in our blood vessels. So, what's the rationale here? Why is the Cleveland Clinic pointing the finger at erythritol, a popular sugar substitute found in gum, lower calorie ice creams, and other calorie and carbohydrate conscious foods? And should erythritol be avoided based on these arguments? Well, they're referencing this new study wherein the researchers uncover some worrying data from some finely tuned experiments that we'll get into those shortly. First, it might be useful for you to understand a bit of the mechanisms, as in how clotting works and why erythritol might be involved. I'll keep it short, but it'll be helpful for understanding the experiments. In short, your blood is filled with many things, from circulating cells to nutrients to other molecules necessary for life. In your blood, you have platelets. Some might consider them cells, but they're really more like fragments of cells because they're missing many cellular components. These platelets circulate through your blood until they're activated. Upon activation, they secrete molecules that activate surrounding platelets and ultimately cascade of events occurs that leads to these platelets to clump together. This clump is used to rudimentarily stick in unwanted openings and block them. Think an injury so we don't lose blood out of our circulation. However, they can be activated by other factors too, not just in response to injury. Anyway, erythritol and like molecules are believed to activate these platelets by somehow interacting with them. And based on other studies that I've analyzed here in Physionic, increase the activation signals within the platelets. One of those activation signals is calcium. Exactly how this happens is not currently known. Just know that erythritol somehow directly and possibly indirectly activates platelets to clump together because they are activated. At least that's what's been proposed. But let's look at the data. In brief, the researchers recruited healthy young men and women and fed them a single dose of erythritol or glucose, sugar. Then they took blood 30 minutes later and measured the platelet aggregation. Remember, that's the clumping of the activated platelets that we just discussed. Here's that data. I know it looks like a lot, but you actually know a lot of this without knowing it, as funny as that sounds. On the left side, we have the uh, people fed erythritol, so 30 grams. And on the right side, we have the people only fled, <laughs> only fled, fed glucose. The vertical axis, the, <laughs> the vertical axis indicates the amount of platelet aggregation. So the higher it goes, the worse in this context. Now, the one part that you aren't familiar with is the ADP concentrations on the horizontal axis. ADP is used to induce platelet aggregation. ADP is a spent energy molecule. I would go more into that, but I don't think that's pertinent to our education here. So just know that our body produces ADP regularly, and it's one trigger for platelet aggregation by binding a family of receptors called P2Y receptors. So the researchers applied increasing concentrations of ADP, moving left to right, to induce aggregation of platelets. The blue boxes are when people had not consumed erythritol, and the red boxes are when people had. The proper comparison here is to look at the red versus blue boxes above each similar ADP concentration. The p-values there they indicate that uh, statistical comparison, and if they're below 0 0.05, they indicate a statistically identified increase in clotting or aggregation with erythritol. Across the board, across all ADP concentrations, erythritol increase platelet aggregation. However, taking a peek at the glucose condition, no effect of glucose. They also ran statistics between the two conditions, called a Friedman test, and identified a difference there too. Erythritol increased plate aggregation, platelet aggregation, I should say, compared to glucose too. 
There's some data looking at uh, different markers of platelet ac activation, like uh, looking at the release of serotonin and platelet factors, but I won't hammer you with that data. It doesn't really make an appreciable difference on our interpretation here, except that it confirms the data that we just went over as erythritol increased the release of these platelet factors, just like we described earlier when platelets secrete molecules. Before we get into what we should take away from all this, let me uh, bore you yet again with the information that I have a premium research review that I run as a one-man operation. And it includes podcasts on all my investigations, premium videos, written summaries of all my premium videos, a private community, protocols, guides, and much more. It's called the Physionic Insiders. If you're so inclined to not only support my work doing this, but also want access to everything in a convenient package, it's linked in the description box for you, if you're so inclined. Okay, so how do we interpret all this? Does this change our daily life? As you can tell by the title of the video, I'm not convinced it changes anything, but there's multiple reasons for that. One, I got a big fat check from the erythritol manufacturers, and come on, your boy wants a new Porsche 911. Two, look at these data again. If we compare the blue and red boxes again, the amount of difference between them is something like 15, maybe 20% absolute difference. We have to ask ourselves if a moderate rise in these effects over baseline are that impactful if they're transient. Because keep in mind, this is only measured 30 minutes after consumption. We don't know if this happens uh, one hour later, five hours later, and so on. Also, how often are people consuming erythritol at 30 gram doses, which is a perfectly normal dose in certain processed foods like lower sugar ice cream, for example, but erythritol found in fruits and other foods are less than 100 milligrams, so an order of magnitude lower. Third, and importantly, the burden of evidence also requires long-term data. We can't base things on a quasi-mechanistic study, even if it is including humans and healthy ones at that. Fortunately, the researchers have done some long-term work, which I've touched on in the past, where they indicate blood erythritol levels track with greater incidence of cardiovascular events, like heart attacks and stroke. However, as I mentioned then and mentioned now, there were some glaring problems with that analysis, like the fact that those with the higher blood erythritol also tend to be sicker. That doesn't even touch on the fact that it wasn't a measure of consumed erythritol, only blood values. So what's the takeaway here? This doesn't budge the needle much for me. Maybe if you consume large amounts of er erythritol every day, you may want to cut back, but if you consume erythritol in passing or in small amounts like in gum, I probably wouldn't change anything. Until we have better evidence, my bribery can continue on my way to my Porsche. And if you're worried about erythritol's cousin, xylitol, I have a video on its supposed heart disease promoting effects, including a bit more on erythritol right here. Thanks for tuning in.